Hi, I'm Peggy Farron. Thank you for joining us on the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Today, we're going to be talking about taking pictures in a forest with Zach Nichols. So stay tuned. We put the show notes on our website at understandphotography.com. So if you'd like to look at some of Zach's amazing photography after you listen to the show, go to understandphotography.com and you'll find the show notes there. But the first thing you're going to see when you get to our website is a little button that says click here for freebies. Now click there and you have a choice of different things you can download, um, you know, how to get tax sharp images every time. That's really popular. Uh, gifts for photography, unique and practical gifts for photographers. That's another popular one. We've got what kind of camera do you, should I buy? Just lots of different things. So you can, you can actually take them all if you want, download them all. You'll have to put in your email address and we are going to put you on your mailing list. That's our, that's, the, that's the exchange we do. We put out a newsletter just once a month and it's full of photography tips and what's coming up with Understand Photography. We also have a couple Facebook groups. One of them is a general group. So if you go to facebook.com slash understand photography, you'll see, um, I don't remember exactly where it is on Facebook, but it says groups. You'll see our two groups. One is general where you can share photos, ask questions, things like that. And then the other one is called selling your photography as art. So we talk more about, you know, how do you sell things online? What do you think about this website? How did you get into art shows? Things like that. So my guest today is Zach Nichols, and he is a Spokane, Washington photographer. He actually is a wedding photographer, but he is so passionate about photography that he is, um, he's, and he's a hiker. So he started doing what we're calling forest photography. And it's really interesting because that's something that I find really difficult to do because it's, you know, trees are cluttered and how do you, how do you figure out what you're gonna take? How do you find the subject? All that stuff we're going to talk about today in the Understand Photography Show. So welcome, Zach. Hi, how are you doing? Good. Thank you for being on the show. I appreciate it. Good. Yeah, thank you for having me. So you do lots of different things, but we're going to talk specifically today about forest photography. But first, just tell our audience a little bit about you. Okay. Yeah. So uh, my name is Zach, obviously. Um I uh, am a wedding photographer here, here in Spokane, which is in Washington, if you don't know. And uh, I should say, since it's on the East Coast, Washington, the state, not D.C., uh, my, I have family that lives over there, so I get that all the time. Um, but anyway, so I live up here. I do wedding photography, and then in my free time, I like doing kind of forest and travel photography as well. Uh, that's something that I started off doing when I started taking photos about four years ago, uh, and it's just kind of been still kind of that passion that's even like in my wedding photography business, that's like woven throughout the entire thing is, you know, like couples among beautiful scenery and things like that. Um, it's definitely a passion of mine. Um, so I have a small family. I have a son who hopefully we won't hear, but he is home running around right now. So, um, yeah. And then I have a wife as well. So, uh, yeah, that's that's kind of like the really quick about me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually kind of excited about this topic because. Of course, we don't have big forests in Florida where I live, but whenever I'm in like a wooded area, it's like, well, what do I take a picture of? Everything just looks cluttered and messy. So mm -hmm. what what like what makes forest photography different from just general landscape photography? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I thought a bit about this. And actually, I think that the thing that really sets it apart is that there's really uh, you know, when you're taking general landscape photos, and these are the ones that you see all the time, it's like there's like these grand landscapes, you know, so you're getting like big mountains and like maybe the Milky Way, you know, galaxies, stuff like that, where it's kind of the big scheme, you know, and then you have this other type of photography, which is more macro photography, you know, and so you have like these kind of two different things with the outdoors. Um, but what I really like about kind of the forest photography, like kind of genre is that uh, it's kind of a combination of all that. So um, something very similar to like what I do with weddings, I also do with uh, the outdoors, and I think I got it mainly from the outdoors, is I kind of start with the grand scheme, like a lot bigger, and then I'll work my way down to kind of the minutia, you know, small details, like literally, you know, like water droplets on a, on a leaf or like, you know, like smaller, like mushrooms or whatever you kind of find. So you're kind of getting down to that macro, but you're also doing kind of the bigger scheme as well. 
So all right, so so let's start yeah. with the with the basics. What kind of gear? What kind of gear do you bring? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, usually, uh, when I'm going on trips and stuff, I usually take zoom lenses. Uh, so when I do weddings, I do prime lenses, and that's pretty much all I shoot with. Um, but when I'm traveling, I always take like a 24 to 70, a 70 to 200. Um, I prefer Tamron. I shoot with Nikon. Uh, I can get into like gear stuff, but just for the sake of it, that's what I shoot with. But um, yeah, I just kind of take those zoom lenses because they're a lot more handy. I'm not swapping them out all the time. Uh, and I definitely like having that lower, you know, that 2.8 sort of capability. But um, every once in a while, I do shoot with a 50 millimeter. That's one that I also take uh, with me on all my trips. Um, it's kind of a little bit interesting because uh, a lot of photographers, especially outdoor photographers, shoot at a really high aperture. Um, but I tend to shoot kind of at a lower aperture a lot of times. Um, and a lot of times I'm actually wide open, which is also kind of a little bit strange from what I've seen <laughs> with other people. Uh, but just kind of a personal, like, I kind of like the artistic look of it and uh, just kind of the feel, I guess. So. Okay. Yeah. So, so you're carrying your 24 to 70 or 70 to 200, mm -hmm. both 2.8 and your yeah. 50 millimeter yeah. and tripod? Yeah. So, um, yep, that's another important thing. So I'll use tripod most times. Uh, it just kind of depends. Like if I really need uh, to kind of hold it still and it's, a, you know, like a longer shutter or anything like that, then I will have a tripod that I use. But a lot of times if it's just, you know, if I'm shooting at like one five hundredth of a second, then I don't need that tripod as much. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. And then I, I do, do carry everything on a backpack. Yeah, so um, I have a backpack that I use. I don't even remember the brand of it. It was just one that I picked up when I first started, and it's held up really well since. So it, it just holds everything. Um, it's waterproof, which I love, uh, especially because I do tend to take photos a lot in the rain uh, and snow and stuff up here. So uh, having it, everything waterproof is super important. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I have so many camera bags you can't even imagine. And I... I keep yeah. like trying to get rid of them and then it's like, Oh, but I might use it for, you know, <laughs> <something."> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't, yeah, I'm not true. loyal to any brand so far, anybody, and it, nobody's wo wowed me enough yet. Yeah. Cause you know, you buy something and then it's too heavy. You know, I'm not, I'm, yeah. I'm not a strong person. So if the bag alone weighs 40 pounds, Oh, you know, I can't. Handle oh yeah. That. Yeah. I completely agree. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm on a quest, a quest for the right bag. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. so when do you go? I mean, is does the lighting is the same principle like the golden hour, the blue hour, or is, or can you take pictures in the middle of the day because you're in the shade? Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of a, a good question too. Um, so I generally don't really have that like blue hour, golden hour thing with when I'm doing like forest photos. Uh, the only time that you might is if you're wanting to obviously get like beautiful light coming through the trees, you know, then you might want to just choose a morning time or do something in the evening where you're kind of getting that, yeah, uh, you know, the sunlight coming through the trees. It's beautiful, you know, that you see all the time. Um, the but generally coming in a direction if in the yeah. morning or night, right? Yeah. So it does look really nice then. Um, but a lot of times when I go out, it's actually like on rainy days, which is kind of strange. Uh, when I first started off, it's kind of a sunny, funny, like, uh, side story is like I absolutely hated taking photos when it was rainy out because I was like oh well there's no beautiful light there's no sun um, but that was before I kind of realized uh, what potential there was when it was raining um, for taking gorgeous photos so um, so yeah when it's raining it's really not as important the time of day I'll, I mean I'll do stuff in the middle of the day uh, and it's just fine and then I'll do stuff kind of later at night uh, or not at night but you know like in the evening uh, and they honestly all kind of look about the same uh, it really uh -huh. just depends what you're doing. So, yeah, I mean, it's just it kind of comes down to, you know, knowing where the light comes from, because even though, you know, in the middle of the day at 12 o'clock, you know, when it's cloudy, the sun's straight up inside of a forest, you're going to have a tree over the top and then it might be complete like a clearing over here. And so you have beautiful light coming into the forest from the side, which is also a really great, you know, it's great lighting. So it's a little bit different in the forest for sure. OK, that's so interesting. Mm -hmm. So that's something to do in the middle of the day when you have nothing else to do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, you can do that, and it looks great. So, that um, do you know who Lewis Kemper is? He lives. Uh, where, where does he live? He lives over by you somewhere. But anyway, he was just on the show, and he, okay. in the middle of the day, does the um, super long exposures to like. Oh yeah. Make mm -hmm. the clouds all mushy and. Yeah. He's like, no, I don't get any sleep because I have to get up early before sunrise. Then I shoot all day. 
I'll oh my gosh. Hook him up to your show and then he could yeah, yeah. the forest in the middle of the day. He'll never get any sleep. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, that's the that's the problem of being a landscape photographer is the, you're up all the time. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm familiar um, with that. All right. So, do you bring a bunch of rain gear then if you're shooting in the rain a lot? Yeah. So, um, my favorite go-to coat that I found, uh, that's not like, you know, there's the super waterproof, which is like kind of like a rubberized like coat that doesn't breathe at all. And it's kind of awful. Um, I've tried those. I don't like them at all because I'm hiking when I'm, when I'm walking around and stuff and like doing, you know, mountain hikes and stuff. And since it can't breathe, it just like, I start sweating and it's terrible. Uh, so I actually use a Patagonia. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but it's basically their best raincoat. That's not the rubberized coat. Uh, okay. and I love that one. So um, in a lot of the photos that you see, actually, uh, if you look at some of my photos, uh, you'll see somebody in like a blue jacket. And that oftentimes is me um, if I'm taking a photo of somebody walking through the forest or something, because uh, I do tend to travel alone probably like 60 percent, 70 percent of the time. Um, okay. I always like having friends with me or like taking people, but not everybody wants to go hiking through a forest when it's rainy. So yeah. that's kind of what happens. <laughs> yeah. For me, it's the Everglades. I like to h- hike into the swamp. And uh, oh man, <laughs> I have to quit putting it on Facebook because yeah. we do Everglades tours, but we don't take our customers. Like uh-huh. you know, they don't get their feet wet. But they, yeah. a lot of people are like, "Oh, I'm not taking your Everglades tour. I'm too scared." And I'm like, "Oh my God, we don't take you out that deep." But yeah, yeah, I'd be in there, but I just like they don't want to. I've be been around there. there and, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't mind the rain, mm. but I wouldn't like the rain and the cold. And that's what you have that combination. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Now, how do you find, like, how do you scout your locations and how do you, what are you looking for when you're looking for a, a location? Yeah. So, um, obviously, if I'm going out for the forest thing, then forest is kind of key. Uh, I tend to like, we have two different types of trees here. So, we have the fir trees, which are, in my opinion, beautiful. And then we have what are called the ponderosa pines or uh, bull pines, as some people call them here. Um, and they're just kind of very different looking trees. And so, I prefer fir trees just because they're kind of that classic um, evergreen look that's more of kind of like the Pacific Northwest kind of feel more than the ponderosa pines. And so a lot of times I'll first like choose a location that has those alpine firs, um, which is a lot of times on mountains is just coincidental. Um, But then other than that, I mean, a lot of times you don't really, I found that you don't really have to scout out a certain location. Uh, Like for instance, you know, Mount Rainier is one of my favorite national parks. Uh, Whenever I go there, I get forest photos that I just love. I'm like, wow, this is incredible. Um, Because pretty much everywhere you turn, there's just incredible forest there. Uh, But here in Spokane, we also have this little tiny mountain, which is more like a hill compared to, uh, you know, what's on the west side towards Mount Rainier and stuff like that. Um, But you can find fir trees on there. And if you're doing like that close up kind of photos, uh, then you're not going to be able to tell like in the grand scheme that you're just on a little hill, you know, like. And so it just kind of depends what you're doing um, and kind of what the goal is. So, you know, uh, yeah, I don't really like as far as locations go, I don't really plan it out too much. It just kind of happens, especially for forest photography. Um, it's so like you you're walking along. Yep. Yeah. You're like walking along or it's a rainy day, you know, uh, and it's like, you know, what? I'm just going to go for a walk through the forest and then just see whatever catches my eye. And uh, and then I'll take photos of it kind of as I go sort of a thing. So I never really plan anything out um, when it comes to forest photos uh, other than like I'll go to a certain location and plan to shoot photos in that area, if that makes sense. So, yeah. yeah. It, OK. Mm-hmm. All right. Interesting. So here's my big question, because how you know, how do you make it look not cluttered and chaotic? I mean, that's, Mm -hmm. it's like, there's all these, of course, maybe your trees are nice and straight, but here we got like trees growing sideways and stuff hanging off of them and everything's just messy looking. Yeah. So how do you, how do you, how do you compose your photo? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question that um, I think has taken a lot of years of just practice uh, to kind of get down and kind of understand a little bit more. Um, cause one of the things that I love about photography and it's just kind of baffles me even still is that you can look at a beautiful scene and you can be like, wow, this is absolutely incredible. But then when you pull up your camera to take a photo, it just doesn't translate at all. And so, um, I think that's what you kind of find a lot with the forest is you might see something you're like, wow, this is gorgeous. And or like this forest as a whole is beautiful, but I can't really find that, you know, how to take a photo of it to really capture it well. Uh, and so I think that what it really comes down to when you're trying to get rid of a lot of the clutter is kind of like, first off, when you're walking up to a scene, it's kind of finding what parts of it you like. Um, You know, like, is there a leading line that is going down where there's kind of like a row of trees 
uh, which happens very rarely, but sometimes in nature. Um, or for instance, you know, is there like some flowers and kind of a clearing and then there's a bunch of trees off in the distance that you kind of want to capture both of them and kind of the feel of it. Um, you know, so you're kind of looking at the bigger picture, but then kind of on a smaller level of kind of like once you're taking the photos, um, I found that there's really two good ways to kind of separate your subjects. Uh, one of them has to do with the environment. So if it's like kind of a foggy day or things like that, that can be a really great way to, to obviously uh, simplify that um, kind of complex nature of the forest and kind of hone in on one certain thing uh, because the, the fog kind of provides a really nice natural gradient um, and it does have that tendency to set things apart. Um, on days where there isn't fog, a lot of times I will use my prime lens or shoot wide open because obviously you're setting something apart by using the bokeh. Um, where it's like you're focused on one particular aspect of the photo. And so everything else is a little bit more blurry. And so it's bringing focus to that one thing that you want to bring focus to. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's for t what you said to me sounded like for kind of more tighter shots in general, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's if you're, okay. if you want to bring like kind of, if you want to call it subject photography, where you're just taking like a photo of one particular thing or kind of honing in on one area. So um, find, you know, of course I don't have the same uh, terrain or what's the right word for mm -hmm. that? Flora. I don't have the same flora as you. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> anyway, no, yeah. But I'm thinking about, you know, our woods are kind of swampy and like we have mm -hmm. boardwalks through the woods basically because it's yeah. swampy <laughs> and uh, it's very gray. There's no color. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there are pops of color, you know, like we've got these pretty swamp flowers called pickerel that are purple and pretty. And, you know, you get the little lizards on them and mm -hmm. the flowers and that kind of stuff. But mostly it's just like gray trees. Yeah, and that makes they sense. They are, you know, they are maybe some diagonal lines or something, but they're not leading to anything other than gray. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of I'm trying to think about this as we're talking. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I guess in that instance, um, you know, if there are like trails going through or there's certain things that are just really cool, like I, I'm a big trail fan. I love taking photos of trails weaving through forests, um, okay. you know, so maybe you have that there or if it's, uh, you know, if it's just all water because it's the Everglades and it's just, you know, you're hiking through all this water, then maybe you might find um, some sort of clearing where the sun's coming through. And it's just like this beautiful scene, you know, where the sun is kind of hitting this one subject uh, in a particular way that just catches your eye. And you're like, whoa, this is amazing. You know, you don't get to see this every day. Um, okay. And so That's I think maybe if, if I was there, that would be something that I'd be looking for a little bit more. OK. All right. That mm -hmm. that Yeah, that helps a lot. Does, yeah. does it matter? Like, um, I'm just thinking of some of my cold pictures, in, like when we're deep in the Everglades. Mm hmm the camera angle makes a huge difference. Like when I put it down closer to the water, it's a much more dramatic picture. Yeah. If I just yeah, hold definitely. it at eye level. Yeah. If there's no mm -hmm. water though in the foreground, I'm just trying, I'm yeah. just thinking through as I'm talking. I'm yeah. wondering, do you do that often? Do you? I, I do. So uh, it just really depends on the shot, you know? Um, so again, if I'm taking a photo of a trail, if I drop the camera down to the trail, then you're not going to be able to see the winding of the trail. It's just going to look like trees coming up from the, from the ground. So like, obviously then, you know, I might even get up higher and find like kind of a hill to stand on or whatever to kind of get that weaving of the, of the trail. But um, if I'm doing something more of like kind of a smaller subject, then a lot of times uh, my wife laughs at me. She comes with me on a lot of trips and she'll see me out in the forest, like running around and like, you know, she'll just be walking and doing whatever and just enjoying it. And I'll be like there with my camera, like going down and going high and, like I'll find a certain subject and I'll just kind of take like a 360 of the subject. If I can't really find an angle that like instantly catches my eye, then I'll definitely do that. If I'm, if I'm not sure kind of what would look the best. So. That's good. That's great. Yeah. And and one of the things I, I notice about your photography is you're very creative about framing. Now, how do you, how do you come up with these cool ideas for framing? Yeah. Um, you know, that's actually, that's kind of a funny thing. So uh, in the wedding industry, I'm just going to like digress for two seconds, but the, in the wedding industry up here, uh, I work with a couple uh, people every once in a while um, who are also wedding photographers in the area. And they always say, um, oh, that's a Zach shot. And what they mean by that is that it's framed. Like it's, you know, whether I'm shooting through something or framed by a couple trees or people or whatever it is, 
that's kind of what they they joke about is saying is like kind of my my type of shot is using framing. Um, and I think that that's just something that's I've kind of just drawn. I'm just drawn to naturally. I don't know what it is. Uh, so whether it's in the forest and I'm using trees or if I'm using um, certain objects or people, uh, you know, that's just kind of it, it just kind of depends. I mean, if, if there's framing there, I love using it because it kind of gives perspective and a feel um, that you're there, if that makes sense. So a lot of times that's go. Go ahead. How do you how do you see the frame? Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. How do you mm -hmm. see that there's a frame here or do you see a picture and you you look for a frame or how does that? Um, it kind of depends. So kind of with anything with uh, outdoor photography for me, I'll start off with just the basic scene. Uh, so let's I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, so let's just kind of take like I've been talking about the trail shot a lot. I do this all the time. So that's why uh, I think this one might make more sense to me to kind of explain. So with the trail um, would be, you know, when you're just taking a photo of a trail, a lot of times I'll look at it and I'll be like, OK, I'll find a trail that has a beautiful bend or there's something about it that's just different that kind of gets the feeling that the that I want the my people that are or I guess people that are looking at my photos, I want them to kind of feel like they're there. And so um, I'll kind of like take a shot of the, the trail and by itself, I might be like, OK, this is cool by itself, but it's missing something. And so um, at that point, I might try doing framing, you know, um, or I might try adding a person to it to kind of get that feel that I want where it's like the audience can kind of feel like they're there with me in that photo sort of a thing um, or that they can associate with the person walking on the trail or whatever it is. Uh, Cause that's kind of the, the photos that I really love taking are the ones that, that people kind of feel a part of um, versus like people sitting back and be like, Oh, this is a great photo, but I don't really have any association to it whatsoever. Um, and that's something that's truly difficult to master. Um, and I definitely work on all the time. So I'm not, saying it all that I'm like great at that but uh that's no, kind of what I, I do actually, for I was going to actually ask you about the putting the people in there but but first we I want to uh -huh. stand framing because you're so good at it and I know there are yeah. a lot of lessons in there and we're going to find those lessons <laughs> yeah, yeah I know it's okay it's, it's kind of something that I thought about a little bit um and definitely something I do and I'm aware of but it's just something that just depends on the photo I mean sometimes it works and sometimes it's just like there is no framing to be had um, but I think when there is framing that I like and that's unique, I definitely choose to do that when I can. So I'll tell you a lesson that I that I learned when I was a wedding photographer mm -hmm. um, from Rick Farrow. I'll never forget the lesson because I was it was something that I knew, but I didn't know if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So what he did is he would make he would grab like a chair. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how chairs usually have some kind of background with holes and he would put the chair wherever he wanted it. And then he would put the lens like through. So the framing of the lattice or whatever it was of the uh -huh. chair would, of course, it would blur out because he was right on top of it practically. Yeah. So you'd have this blurry, cool frame of the bride or whatever it was. And I think in nature photography, that's a way to make a frame is you can just you know, find some leaves and get close and just mm -hmm. have them. Right. I mean, that's, yeah. I'm just thinking, I'm thinking as we're talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I didn't, I don't remember you seeing a lot of stuff like you that you did like that, but that is one way to create mm -hmm. your frames. If you don't see a frame. Yeah, I definitely to see them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't know if I would see that as a frame that you, you mm -hmm. know, you make this perfect little frame. So I don't know, but I yeah. the, I did want to ask you about putting the people in because, um, like, is there a like? Do they have to have a certain outfit on? Or you said something about your blue jacket. Do you yeah, put that yeah. on other people sometimes? Uh, it's it's kind of rare. Um, like I won't lie, my wife would definitely say it's true that sometimes I'll be like, okay, you need to wear this color or like this sort of thing. Um, which is kind of like a pre-planned, like I kind of know what looks good uh, and what kind of thing I'm going for. Um, but a lot of times it's just, you know, like I don't I don't have multiple jackets. I just have one blue jacket and like a red jacket for winter, you know. So like I didn't when I first bought those, uh, luckily, I, I guess I chose a good color um, in my opinion. But um, I, I didn't like pre-plan what I was buying, you know. But if if people are watching this and they're like, oh, I want like a cool coat, then 
just like a quick detour is like if you're doing you know the forest or something you have a beautiful green and so you might choose to do kind of like a yellow or complementary color sort of thing is what i'm going for it's kind of like yellow orange orange i feel like can be a little bit too much so uh so i tend to like yellow and red more um, another thing that i don't really do as often but i have done in the past is you can actually take the color of the coat so if you have a yellow jacket you can change the color in photoshop really easily and so basically you have access to any sort of color that you want uh, so let's say that you go out and you're wearing like I'm wearing my blue jacket and I'm wearing it like outdoors on a moody day and it's already kind of blue tones or something. And I'm like, wow, I really don't like that blue. Uh, then I can go into Photoshop and kind of adjust those colors a little bit to kind of get a color that I like more, um, which is where the kind of the editing side of it comes in. And some people choose to do that. Some people are like, no, I want to keep it exactly how it was. Uh, but that's right, just kind so of personal if preference. If somebody doesn't so. know how to change the color of the coat. Can you just yeah. tell us quickly in Photoshop? Yeah, yeah. So uh, in Photoshop, what you'll go do, um, and there's multiple ways to kind of do this, but I'll just explain what I do. Um, so you'll go in, uh, you'll, what I do is I'll create a copy of whatever the photo is so that I can go back to the original if I need to using masks and things. Um, so create a copy of the photo uh, and then go in and select the, um, the coat itself. So you can either do that by painting on a mask uh, by hand if it's kind of not really if the selection tool isn't working very well, or you can use the selection tool, which is a great way to do it, um, at least to start. And then once you do that, you can go in and there's a couple different ways of doing it. You could do a cover, a color overlay, um, which is sometimes what I will do, or you can just adjust the hue and saturation, which is kind of a, I think it's called a filter for it or something. I can't remember exactly what the terminology is for it, um, but it's basically a separate layer. What was that? How do you do the color overlay? I, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, so um, what you do is you'll create a separate layer and you'll do uh, and you'll do a fill layer, I think is what it's called, um, and you'll do a color fill. And so a lot of times I'll just choose yellow just to default because you can change it later on. Um, and so then what you do is you'll do that over this and then you'll put the mask that's a selection um, of that coat over the top of that. So you'll mask that color just to the coat and then you'll mm -hmm. do. Um, oh, I'm trying to think of exactly what it's called. I could like if I looked at it, it would be super. Yeah, so you use a blending mode basically, and you'll do, I think it's colorize or uh, it's like color, right? There's selective color, something like that. Um, and that's in, that's in the layers palette in the blending mode. Yes, yeah. So when you're doing it, instead of doing like the normal blending mode or a screen, it's there's one that's like color, I think is what it is. Okay. And so when you're using that separate layer, it'll adjust it and put it on top of it, but still account for the, the lights and the darks and everything. Okay. Um, and then once you do that, you can go into the like there's kind of like the color slider or kind of color box and you can choose kind of, you can move around the colors and see how each color looks, oh, um, which that. is kind of, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it works really well. There's, um, and honestly, I'm doing such a bad job of explaining it. I wish that I would have like written down the exact words and I could totally look it up, but uh, there's a ton of tutorials online. If you look it up, um, a lot of them do use that method. So color overlay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And mm -hmm. you're basically just, you're using layers and yeah, the blending modes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, a blending mode layer, and then uh, yeah, just the selection of the coat. So. Okay. Yeah. Well, anybody who knows Photoshop could probably figure it out from there. But anybody uh, yeah. else can do a YouTube video search. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, super. It's it's pretty straightforward. So definitely a little bit uh, more advanced than just doing Lightroom, but you know, it's whatever people want to do. Maybe I'll even do a little video for our two. We we put a short video out every Tuesday. Maybe I'll maybe okay. I'll learn how to do it and put the video out. Cause do I it. I mean, it literally it takes, minutes. yeah, it takes literally like two or three minutes to change the you know color of a coat, depending on how big it is and in the frame, of course, but yeah, pretty quick. And do you tend to, so if you have somebody walking down a path, you tend to center everything like the path, if it's a winding path um, and then center it, them in the path or. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. It, it just kind of depends. Um, like I've done quite a few where I, I'm not a, a stickler to like the rule of thirds or something like that. I just kind of do whatever my eye tells me, uh, which isn't always like a perfect rule of thirds. Uh, I never did just as a side thing. I never went to photography school. I never learned any of that stuff. I'm aware of it just through time um, and through research and stuff. Um, but I just kind of do whatever my eye is like drawn to, I guess. So mm -hmm. sometimes the pathway will be right in the middle uh, with a person in the middle. Sometimes the pathway will be off to the right and then the curve will be around and then the person will be on like the other thirds. Uh, you know, so it's like a person on the thirds here and then the trail beginning here on this side. Uh, so it just really kind of depends on the the shot and uh, what, I'm, what I'm seeing with my eye. Yeah. And it, mm -hmm. I mean, just what you said before, you just move around and try several different things. You never know yeah. what what might look 
best. I yeah, get so definitely. lucky. I was just talking about this it was to somebody yesterday. I can't remember who now. And uh, I went to see the dark hedges in Northern Ireland. Do you know what they are? Oh, yeah. Game yeah, that'd Thrones. be super cool. Uh-huh. I've never seen Game of Thrones, but I've seen the dark hedges. <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, I wasn't on a photography tour. I was on a, but a bus tour. And it feels crowded there. Everybody wants to see them. There's cars and there's people and everything like that. Mm-hmm. And I just got so lucky that I got myself in the right position and zoomed a little. I just had my little bridge camera with me and zoomed yeah. in enough. And a guy was just walking down the street and he had this little cap on. It was like, you know, it was a color. I can't remember now. I think it might've been red because it looks black and white, even though the picture's not in black and white, it looks like it's in black and white, except for that little yeah. pop of color. It uh-huh. was so cool, but he was, that is really cool. was dead center and it looked, well, he wasn't dead center. I actually photoshopped him to move him over a little bit because <laughs> he looked better yeah. dead center. <laughs> uh-huh. No, I've definitely done that before. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, it was, I was just lucky there. And that yeah. was, if you ever want to see the coolest forests in the world, yeah, that, that would was, be pretty cool. I think they're spruce trees, and they planted them like in 1600 or something. So they're huge, oh, wow. and they go over the like a canopy, you know. But they're they're big, thick, like naked trees. Like there's not a lot of bark on them. They're, it's mm-hmm. so cool. Yeah, that would be really neat to see sometime. It was it was yeah. really cool, and I didn't even know where we were going because just somebody on the bus had said, "Oh, they wanted to see them," so they gave a little special detour for us. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, yeah, that'd be really neat. Yeah. It was fun. Mm-hmm. Um, so do you do like horizontal shots, vertical? Do you vary? What do you think looks yeah. best? Yeah. So it just kind of depends again on the, the shot. I mean, uh, sometimes with the framing, if I'm using framing, it'll look better vertical, uh, sometimes horizontal. Uh, I, I, do, I do have to confess that when I first started off, um, I did a lot of Instagram, like too much actually. And so I started shooting a lot of vertical shots. Um, and I would stick to pretty much just with weddings. I almost stick to horizontal all the time, like probably like 90%, 10% vertical. Um, but yeah, it was really bad for landscapes. I just shoot vertical all the time. And uh, it's kind of like a, a digression of like a kind of a rough part of my life where I just kind of got obsessed with social media stuff. And then uh, after about eight months of that, um, I was dating my wife currently. Um, and it just kind of like got into our relationship because I was so obsessive with it. And so I completely got rid of Instagram. Um, and I did that for a year and a half, which was honestly the best choice of my life. Uh, and, uh, yeah. And so then kind of during that time, I kind of re-explored photography and like what it meant to me. And I started shooting a lot more horizontal, um, which is good. <laughs> Definitely good thing. Um, and so now it just kind of like, I feel like it's an even balance because when I go out into, you know, the nature and stuff, um, I have returned to Instagram and I do Instagram, but it's not something that is near as obsessive with me. Like I, it's, Something that literally I feel like if my wife was like, or if I wanted to someday just completely get rid of it, you know, I could do it today. I could do it tomorrow. It's really doesn't, I just enjoy posting that there, but it's not a lifestyle if that makes sense anymore. So um, I, I, to answer I that. Wish I, I wish I would get fanatical about it. To me, it's a job. It's a chore. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. That's uh, the like outdoor landscape and travel is my passion still. And it never feels like a job to me um, because that's what weddings are to me as a job. And so, uh, and I like to keep them like very separate, if that makes sense. Um, and not really like doing outdoor landscapes for a pay. Yeah. The Instagram is what I meant to do all the social media. That's to me, that's a job to me. I just, yeah, I kind of resent it. You know, it's like, Oh crap. I got to get something on Facebook. Like who cares what I'm eating? Who cares where I am? Who cares about, you know what I mean? I just kind of whatever, but I guess people do. Yeah, it's true. So um, people do like to stay up to date on other people (laughs) on social media. So, uh, but yeah, so kind of getting back to like the horizontal vertical thing is I do a lot more horizontal now, um, but it just really depends on the photo. You know, if it's something that's more of a vertical shot and it's like a tree that's really tall and I just want to get everything, then a lot of times maybe I will do a vertical shot. Um, But I do like variation. So maybe I'll take both, you know, maybe I'll do vertical and horizontal and see what I like later. So All right. So let's talk about different ways to decrease the cluttered look of a forest. Tell Uh me some ideas in shooting and in processing on how to make it look less cluttered. Now, the first tip you gave us was to find a subject. Yeah. Kind of focus in on that or frame it. 
That's uh-huh. another way, right? What yeah. else can we do? So, uh, yeah, that's kind of the thing is uh, finding that subject originally. And then the next thing is saying, you know, now that I found this beautiful spot or area or maybe thing, um, how am I going to take this or capture it the best way that I can with the gear that I have? Uh, So obviously, as photographers, we have a lot of ways to do that where we can mess around with shutter speeds if we're trying to capture movement um, or we can do a different aperture if we want to set it apart. Um, But I guess the thing that I would encourage most people to do that are landscape photographers is kind of like counterintuitive to how it's we're kind of like taught originally or how most people do it is like being willing to drop that aperture all the way down even during the daytime when you're not doing astrophotography or anything like that is like being willing to kind of set your subject apart um, through using a lower aperture because I feel like that's something a lot of people uh, don't really see or don't really think of um, because they're so used to shooting at such a high aperture that let's say um, for instance one of my favorite photos um, is like a photo of this little water droplet coming off of a, a branch. And I think that you might have that photo, I can't remember, um, but you can see it like on my Instagram or on my website, whatever. Uh, but anyways, that photo is something that I took wide open with a 50 millimeter. Um, okay. But most people open. would take, and yeah, so that was a 1.4, yeah. 1.4? Yeah, and it was pretty close to me. I mean, it was only like three feet away or something like that. So obviously it's really blurring out the background and the foreground. Uh, but for that photo, I really think it did it justice. And if I had used a higher aperture and gotten like the the front part in focus and the back in focus, it would have been a lot more kind of lost in translation and that water droplet wouldn't have stuck out near as much. Okay. Um, so that's one way when you're taking the photos of themselves to kind of like set things apart. Um, okay. And then later on, kind of getting to the editing side, once you move to that, um, there are certain things you can do, but obviously you should be doing a lot of it in your camera so that when you get to editing, you don't have to do quite as much. Uh, but that being said, the best ways that I've found to kind of set subjects apart um, in editing, there's kind of two ways. And one of them I learned from a landscape photographer um, who was just like a genius. Uh, the one of my favorite things digressing a little bit of traveling is being able to meet other photographers. Um, whenever I do that, I will try and find one or two people and strike up a conversation just you know, even if it's a bad time, we're both shooting sunrise and he's like running around and I'm just like, you know what, I'm not going to take the shot because I'd rather talk with people and get to know people. And uh, photography is such a social thing for me. But I learned from this one photographer who I talked to with, um, just like I learned from so many things from all different types of people. But he said uh, that when you're editing, a lot of times you can bring a uh, focus to like the warmer parts of the photo and the colder parts of the photo. And he would even take it a little bit farther and he would add like a little bit of Uh, colder tones to certain areas and warm up certain areas to kind of bring more focus. Um, Because what he said, and I completely agree, is there's basically uh, three ways to kind of bring focus in a photo, which is um, light to dark contrast. So like your eyes are naturally drawn to the light um, versus the darker parts of the photo. Uh, And then there's also um, the warmth and the cold uh, side of it, where your eye is drawn more naturally to warm colors uh, than to the colder tones. And then the other part is using like bokeh and focus um, so that like the, the things that are out of focus, your eye isn't drawn to near as much as the things that are in focus. Um, and so if you take that and you apply that to editing, um, then again, you're going to have that, like you might want to bring up the warmness in a certain area if it's kind of like a sunny day sort of thing more. Um, and then, you know, kind of maybe accentuate the coldness if you want to. Um, another thing that I'll do to kind of help um, accent or maybe uh, bring out the def- like the bokeh a little bit more is um, I've been using clarity uh, a little bit on photos and clarity is one of those things that I like to joke with people is like everybody starts off uh, and if you do this or if anybody does this don't be offended this I'm just saying this is just kind of a thing that I did and a lot of people do that I see is that um, they'll find that clarity slider and they're like oh this thing is amazing and they'll put it all the way to 100 and they're like this is awesome and I definitely did that when I first started I also did that with saturation slider I did not recommend it um, but anyways so that's something that I do is like uh kind of interesting enough in a lot of landscape photos where it is really busy um, and this is super common with winter photos in particular um, I'll use clarity and I'll actually bring the clarity down um, to about like negative 10 negative 15 kind of in that area when I'm doing for like a global edit and then I'll take an actual um, like I guess a gradial filter gradient filter no not a gradient filter a radial filter sorry and I'll put that over whatever the subject is or maybe I'll use some type of filter or paint it in where I'll bring the clarity up by about 20 um, to basically kind of bring it out and like accentuate that from the background a little bit more and kind of uh, soften up the rest of the photo, if that makes sense. Okay, so, so basically you're using the clarity on your subject 
and yeah. it makes the rest of the subject look a little soft for the, yeah, the rest so, of the picture look a little softer. Yeah, it does. And actually okay. some photographers out there, they do uh, similar things, but then there are people who actually bring down the clarity by like, you know, negative 60 or something to create that really soft kind of foresty feel, um, which is kind of more of like a whimsical kind of fantasy kind of feel uh, that like, I don't really do it quite that much. I just do it just so that it still looks natural, but it's not like over edited. And that's the key for me. Um, with editing is that I never like to over edit. I just like to edit how I kind of felt it was at the time. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's some good stuff. Especially yeah. <laughs> the, you know, the, the color, I wouldn't have thought of that. I hadn't heard that before. To yeah. Warm it makes sense when you think about it. Go to the warmth and that does make yeah. sense. I just never, yeah. I never heard it. I never thought about yeah. it. That's awesome. What yeah. about converting things to black and white? Do you do that much or? Um, I don't do it as much with landscape. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I think I've done it a couple times, but it's just more for artistic stuff, but I don't really, um, like if I'm printing off a photo for somebody or something, if they ask me for black and white, I'd be like, I can, but I really love the photos that I post. I love them in color. Um, so no, I don't really do too much black and white, especially to accentuate like certain things. I don't really do that as much. Um, yeah, that's just something I don't know. It's just personal it's taste, thing. I guess. I don't really, yeah. I just don't really do black and whites too much. So, yeah, yeah. I know it's, it's everybody has a thing. <laughs> yeah. Know, that's oh, definitely. That's for sure. They should, yeah. you know, that's actually, we teach, we teach a class called selling your photography as art and, uh -huh. you know, coming up with a look is really important. So, you know, you like color, stay in color. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Do you do you use things like focus stacking so that you can get everything sharp ever? It sounds like you don't like everything sharp, though. Yeah, yeah, I know. Like I said, I'm kind of weird that way. Um, I used to when I first started off, I used focus stacking and I know how to do it. But it's just not it's not really something that I do very often um, because like I guess something that like I actually thought about this and I've been asked this question a lot is that like, even though I love landscape photography, I feel like I'm more of a subject photographer. And I know that, that like, I kind of have to define that a little bit, but that when I'm taking photos of something, um, it's rarely like ever the giant landscape. A lot of times it's like a certain part of the landscape that I like. Uh, so you'll see, you know, like people in my photos. And so like maybe the person is the focus, but then like the beautiful scenery is also kind of the focus, but I'll do things, whether it's aperture or different things like that to bring them kind of more, make them more of the focus. So, um, you know, or like taking photos where the tree is a focus or like a flower or um, just different things. So I, that's why I, what I mean by subject photography is it's not really kind of a grand scheme. It's more of like there's a certain part of the photo that I'm bringing focus to. Um, okay. And that's and I do that a lot with with bokeh and the use of aperture. So, yeah. Um, what about like the shadows? I mean, are, aren't there some some parts of your picture that come out like really, really black? Do you do bracket mm -hmm. or? What do you do? What do you do with these dark shadows or do you just yeah. leave them? Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's kind of something I go back and forth with a little bit. But in general, when I edit, I don't really edit for true blacks. Um, sometimes there will be blacks in my photos, but in general, I don't really do that too much. Uh, but when I am taking the photo, um, I do use and I'm not going to like I don't really have brand loyalty, but nobody can really argue too much. Um, it's getting less the case anymore. But when I first started, Nikon was definitely the winner as far as um, dynamic range goes. You know, if you're using a Canon versus a Nikon versus like earlier on, like the Sony, Sonys are great. Um, but yeah, I think still Nikon has still got a little bit of an edge over most other brands. Um, so I found that with Nikon, they have such a crazy dynamic range that you can bring out those shadows so much to where there aren't any true blacks, even if you're adjusting for the highlights, uh, like in uh, a sunset, for instance, you know, if, you, if you're doing that, I've done that a few times. Um, or quite a few times and I'll get all the shadows back and there's you no know, color issues or anything like that. So, oh, okay. um, but so yeah, but generally shadows out in Photoshop or Lightroom. Um, I do Lightroom. Yeah. Lightroom. So okay. I tend not to edit in Photoshop. The only reason that I edit in Photoshop is to remove something or to uh, do a very specific adjustment to a part of the photo that I can't do in Lightroom. Lightroom. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's the way of the world right now. That's, it's just yeah. so easy to do global stuff in Lightroom and, and not is. even global stuff. I mean, they got the adjustment brush and the radial and all that stuff too. So yeah, there's really not much that you can't do in Lightroom for sure. 
do you use any like plugins or anything like that that you really like for landscapes uh, and forests? I used to have a ton actually. Um, I can't even remember what they were. Uh, but there was a lot of um, oh, what was it called? Uh, where it would like kind of do a mask of like the different um, like brightness, brightness. That's kind of a bad exposures, I guess. So like if it was a really bright part of the photo, it would mask that part, certain part out. And then like same going all the way down to the darkest parts of the photo. So then you could select certain areas and kind of adjust like the lighting on it and um, the colors. And I think that was more when I was doing, when I really liked the fine art sort of look of the landscapes where you see kind of like those general, like, um, you know, like all the wallpapers that you have for your backgrounds on your computers and stuff like that. We are just creating these really magnificent images. Um, I think that that's what I was doing a lot more back then uh, and what I really liked the look of. And so I did have some more plugins, but now I just kind of like keeping it super natural. And even though there's certain parts that I might not like as much where I could have brought that out or changed the color or whatever it is, I just tend to leave it um, and just kind of mostly work with Lightroom. So, okay. yeah. Okay. So yeah, I don't really use too many plugins anymore. I keep buying them and then I don't get around to learning them. You know, I bought yeah. Topaz three different times because I forgot I had it. <laughs> oh man, yeah. I know. <laughs> So now, now it's easier. It's it, it, you know, because now you just download. So now you're in their system. It's not you can't make those stupid mistakes like I did. But three, oh years, yeah, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't cheap, and I forgot because well, sure. I never got along to using it. But anyway, but I like the I like that creative stuff. I just never do it. Like yeah, some, you know, some of the different looks that people have. So yeah, but I yeah, I, that's the I, thing I. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the things I love about photography is just how different everybody's style is um, and how you can like you can take little bits and pieces of what you like about other people's stuff and apply it to yours, um, whether it's a way of shooting and taking the photo or editing itself. So, um, yeah, it's definitely an amazing thing about photography. Yeah, I uh, I am always pushing not not so much to the editing, but that's a good idea. But I'm always telling people you need to get out and shoot with other photographers. You will mm -hmm. learn so much. Um, yeah. If you're open-minded, because some people know everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a lot it's of YouTube, super funny. YouTube uh, people who come across me who absolutely know everything. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That's, That's where they it. People YouTube. are very prideful about that. So. But um, if you're yeah. open-minded and you can just watch what people are doing, and you're like, oh, that's a good idea to turn the, you know, tilt the camera, or you mm -hmm. know, you see somebody doing stuff maybe you know how to do. Like, you know, I like to do the. Um, um, I can't think of what it's called, like the vertical blur or the zoom blur, or that kind of stuff. I like to yeah. do that, but I don't always think about it. And you'll see somebody uh -huh. doing, oh, that's a great idea on this picture, whatever. So it's a good idea to to have friends who are photographers. Oh, completely. Yeah, I agree with that. So, yeah, I always tell people that, too, um, especially like professionals in my era when we're having conversations and they really seem like stuck in an area or they're just like they kind of have that mindset where I know everything and like there's nothing else I can learn. Um, I am a really blunt person and so sometimes it bites me in the butt when I'm that way but um, I always tell people to always be a student and always be a learner especially with photography because you will never know everything because it's always moving forward and uh, and it's an art style and art means that there is no set like normal you know and so if you think that you know everything um, then I feel like that's really kind of the death of your creative freedom and, and your artistic mind uh, because you're not open to creating new things. You're just reproducing the same thing over and over. Exactly. That's mm -hmm. so true. Yeah, that is so true. Keep it humble and always want to learn. So, yeah. all right. So, so give us some, let's, let's summarize some of the different things. Okay. So go ahead. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So, uh, just in general, like everything that we went over sort of a thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So quick summary, uh, for forest photography is what we're, we're going with. So, um, you know, choose, choose lenses that you like to use that, uh, you're not carrying too much with you. Cause that's the biggest thing when you're going through the forest and going on hikes is you're not taking all your gear with you as, as tempting as it is. Um, so again, I use the 24 to 70, uh, sometimes I'll bring a 50 millimeter if I feel like I'm going to do some closer shots and some macro stuff. Uh, and then the 70 to 200 is one of those luxury lenses where if I'm not going on a super steep hike, um, I'll take that with me because every once in a while there's something out from the distance or there's something I want to zoom in on that it's really useful. But if it's a crazy hike, I'm not going to touch that thing. It's just the 24 to 70 probably and that's it. <laughs> so, um, and then when you're taking photos, uh, I would say start big and then work small. 
Um, so start with the, the giant landscape, you know, and then work down to like a little water droplet or, um, you know, like a mushroom or a flower or whatever it might be. And, uh, you know, keep in mind that throughout the day, there might not be, you know, that grand landscape might not be the greatest thing to take photos of. And that's what I run into is it's like, wow, it's just not really what I wanted. Um, but don't close down and be like, oh, you know, there's nothing to take photos of then um, because I can't get the shot that I wanted. Um, be open to working your way down and then maybe you'll find something in the minute details where you're like, wow, this is incredible. Um, when you're taking photos, uh, like we kind of talked about, there's different ways to bring focus to a certain subject. Um, so again, when you're taking the photo itself, you can use aperture to kind of do that where you're taking a lower aperture. Uh, you can use framing, um, just kind of whatever it is uh, to bring focus or bring focus to a certain subject or the, uh, the scenery when you're taking the photo itself. Um, later on, when you're editing, you can use a variety of things. So I use clarity um, where I'll use negative clarity to kind of uh, soften up the outer, the stuff that's not the subject of the photo. And I'll use clarity itself. So like, you know, a little bit extra um, to bring focus to a certain subject and I'll do it just to whatever is to my eye, you know, whatever, whatever looks good to you sort of a thing. Um, and then another way of doing that again is, is using like uh, cold, you know, maybe accentuating the cold and bringing out the warmth a little bit more of the certain parts that you want to, uh, bring focus to um that's a great way of doing that so i'm um, trying to think anything else not was, i can't think of anything else too much another thing that i thought about that i do a lot to bring you know to kind of hone things in is i use a vignette in editing just mm -hmm. to kind of darken the edges a little just kind of bring the eye in a little bit i did want to ask you one more question though that i forgot is, yeah because um, you use a drone on occasion too don't you i do uh-huh and yep. now do you carry, do you carry that with you often or is it a big one? Is it a little one? I don't, yeah. You know, so all I over use, the place now. Yeah, yeah, they are. Um, so I use the DJI Mavic Pro 2, um, which is the smaller one, but it has a the better camera than the first Mavic Pro that came out. Um, okay. It came out at literally crazy story. It came out the day, the same day that I was going to buy uh, the Mavic or the Phantom 4 Pro. So it was like, you know, a bigger thing, but I wanted a better camera. And so I had been thinking about it for about a month. I got on to buy it and they were, they had just announced the Mavic 2 Pro. And I was like, this is literally what I was looking for. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was ridiculous timing anyways. So um, yes, I do take it with me sometimes, but a lot of times for drone photos, I kind of scout things out ahead of time. And so I have an idea in my mind, um, am I going to use my drone or am I not? Um, the greatest tool for drone photos is Google Earth. So you just like, you look in the area that you're going, you see if anything catches your eye where you're like, whoa, this is like super neat from the sky. So it must be pretty cool with my drone. So I'm gonna take my drone with me or not. Um, and then I'm always a super big uh, proponent of doing things legally, especially with drones. Um, and it's becoming more and more of a uh, an issue, I feel like as time goes on. Um, but just making sure that wherever you fly your drone, that is legal, that you're never pushing the boundaries or you're like, you know what, nobody's, nobody's going to catch me, you know, that sort of thing. Cause that's a good way to really get in trouble real quick. Um, so yeah, I do use my drone sometimes, um, but I'll scout it out ahead of time on Google earth. Um, and then just decide, you know, do I want to carry this extra weight with me or do I even need to? Because a lot of times I'll just be in my car, I'll fly it from my car, um, wherever I want to take the photo from not out of my car, but like, you know, I'll basically roll up to the location, fly my drone from my, where I parked at, and then um, just kind of like put it back in my car and store it and then go out hiking or something. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, just, so. I did see you had some cool pictures from the drone. That's why <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't want to forget to ask that. <laughs> oh yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> All right. So what, tell us what adventures are coming up for you. Yeah. So, um, I, let's see, we're going to North Carolina, actually, uh, as a family here pretty soon. And I'm looking forward to taking kind of my photography gear with me and uh, trying to take some photos of very different things than I normally do, because there's not as many forests there. Um, have you been to the Outer Banks or, or are you familiar? I have, with yeah. So I have family that lives in North Carolina and they had a, a they called it a cottage in the Outer Banks for a while, but it's, it wasn't a cottage. It was like a mansion. I was like, you guys are crazy. Um, but yeah, super cool place. Uh, we're going to be in Wilmington, though. Um, which is pretty cool. And then uh, let's see, I'm hoping to go back to the Olympic Peninsula, which is on the Washington coast, um, probably in May if I can. And then I always have a list of places, but I'm hoping to go to the Grand Tetons this year if I can. And then uh, of course, Mount Rainier is one of my go-tos. It's like three hours away from my house. So it's like a long drive, but an easy drive for me. It's really not that far. Uh, I'll probably do that once or twice this year. So what's your website? Uh, so my website is zachnichols.com. 
so it's not spelled like my real last name with an S at the end. It's actually a Z, just like my Instagram handle. So Z-A-C-H-N-I-C-H-O-L-Z uh, dot com. Yeah. Begins with a Z, ends with a Z. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's, it's different. <laughs> yeah, I just bring extra emphasis to that to that S at the end. So now, do you that's have, funny. You have one website for your landscape and your wedding photography. Is that all one? Yeah, website? I do. Okay. Yeah. So um, I basically have a, a part of my website that I sell prints on um, and then I'll upload blog posts for certain areas that I go and travel to uh, fairly often. Uh, but otherwise, my website is mainly for weddings um, just because that's what I do for a living, you know, in the the other stuff is a passion, but it's definitely not something I focus on um, yeah. quite as much on the website. So, okay, yeah. okay, yeah, I was just yeah, I was pretty much, curious. yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty much all my travels, though, I make some sort of blog post where it's like, if you go here, check this out, and then I share it with all my friends, um, just because like I love sharing the outdoors with people, and so that is one thing that I do on my website. Awesome, ZachNichols.com. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's thank true. you for being on the Understand Photography Show, Zach. Yeah, thank you very much for having me again. And to our, our audience, if you'd leave us a review on iTunes, it really, really helps us. We come up in the search engines better, and, and it makes us feel good, too. You know, this is a lot of work, so it's nice to know somebody appreciates it. <laughs> I'm Peggy Farron. Thank you so much for watching the Understand Photography Show. We will see you next Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Get up!